Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today at the start of October. I want you to know about some great things we have coming up this month in the life of our church, starting with a big event at the very end of the month. So once again, on October 31st, Halloween night, we are so pleased to be hosting our community in our church parking lot for our Trunk or Treat event. If you've never been out to one of those before, we line up a bunch of cars and vehicles, and we decorate the trunks in a variety of themes, and we hand out probably way too much candy to the kids of our neighborhood. It's a great time for the community to come together. We have a food truck on site. We have uh, coffee and hot chocolate available, chance to get to know our neighbors and our community. It's a wonderful chance to just be together as a church and make an impact in a local community. So if you'd like to be involved, there's a few ways to be involved in that night. One is to sign up to host a trunk, to decorate your trunk and hand out candy. The other is just to be a volunteer on site. There's a variety of ways you can be involved in just the logistics of making the event function and work. So if you're interested in being involved, reach to the church office, talk to Lynn, connect with myself or Pastor Danny or any of the other staff members. There's also uh, information and links on our Facebook page and the weekly church email for how to get involved in that. We strongly encourage you to, encourage you to join us for Trunk or Treat on October 31st. All right, next weekend, it's Thanksgiving long weekend on the Saturday afternoon. That is October the 8th. Uh, Francine will be hosting her the Craft Together event for our women. Uh, so you can check out the information for that online as well. Then on Thanksgiving Sunday, we do have an opportunity for water baptism. So if you have made a decision to follow Jesus but have not yet uh, been baptized in water, we would love to have a conversation with you about that and give you the opportunity to take that step uh, in faith. Uh, so talk to one of our pastors. We'd love to get you involved uh, with that on Thanksgiving Sunday. And the weekend after Thanksgiving, we had a couple more things going on on Saturday, October the 15th. It's a church work day, 9 a.m. till noon. We'll have a group of us here at the church take care of the grounds, get things ready for winter, pull weeds, take care of some odds and ends around. So Come out and join us. Many hands make light work. That's how the old axiom goes. And the more people that can come out and help, the quicker things can get done and the more we can accomplish that day. We will also have some uh, drinks and treats available that day for you as well. And then on Monday, October the 17th, our ladies will be hosting their next Gene event. It's an incredible event for women to come together, uh, to eat together, to drink together, to hear each other's stories, uh, and to just really celebrate community and to walk together in faith. So that's uh, Monday, October the 17th, starting at 7 p.m. You can talk to uh, my wife, Erica, or Danny's wife, Leanne, uh, or other women uh, involved in the planning, such as Sarah Berta, for more information for that event. All right, I believe that that's all that's going on right now. We have so much coming up in the next few months, so stay tuned for more information. As always, check the weekly email, check the church Facebook uh, group, or the church website. All the information will be available there, available there as well. And with that, church starts now. All right, good day, church. How are we doing today? Everyone well? Anyone feeling, anyone feeling drained? Anyone feeling stressed? Anyone feeling anxious? Is there anyone in, in desperate need just a break from life? <laughs> you know, it's no secret that our world is in the midst of a mental health crisis. The trajectory was already there a few years back, and the events of the past two and a half years have only served to accelerate our society deeper into this crisis. According to the World Health Organization, around 450 million people currently struggle with mental illness, making it the leading cause of disability worldwide. Here in Canada, one in two Canadians, let that sink in for a second, one in two Canadians will have or have already had a mental illness by the time they reach 40 years of age. The mental health crisis is damaging on both a societal and personal level. It impacts our economy, impacts our quality of life, impacts our physical health, impacts our relationships. There's also a significant interrelationship between addiction and mental health, which affects all part of our being and shapes the society that we live in. The need for education, the need for acknowledgement, the need for tools and resources is incredibly high. 
The mental health crisis is an epidemic that will only continue to grow unless we are able to properly equip ourselves and our society to deal with it. Now, today we're wrapping up Volume 1 of our current series, A Worthy Life, with the fourth and final chapter of Philippians. So you might be wondering, what's the connection between mental health and Paul's letter to the church in Philippi? Well, return with me for a moment to the first message of this series that I preached a few weeks back. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul encouraged us to let our manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, to live our lives worthy of the good news that has saved our souls and changed us from the inside out. And it's that last part that keeps catching my attention, the idea that the gospel of Christ changes us from the inside out, the idea that the gospel changes us. In his letter to the church in Rome, Paul phrases it this way. It's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is the NIV I'm reading from. He says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. If the world is headed in one direction, if the world is barreling towards a mental health health crisis with no hope for change, there's good news. We don't have to conform to the pattern of our world. Because the gospel changes us. It changes us from the inside out. And and part of that change is the renewal of our mind. So I want to look at Philippians chapter 4 today through the lens of mental health. If we are encouraged in his word to renew our minds, I have to believe that God will provide us with the instructions on how to do so. And there are six verses in Philippians 4 that just so happen to address how we think and the health of our minds. We can't ignore the fact that that living a life worthy of the gospel means allowing the gospel to actually change us, which includes our minds, includes our mental health. So as we bring volume one of A Worthy Life to a close today, my prayer is this, my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we will discover what it truly means to have peace of mind. Whether you have struggled with mental health in the past, whether you are currently struggling with mental health, whether you have yet to struggle with mental health, God's plan for you is a transformed life, a renewed mind, and a peace that passes all understanding. So let's pray and then we'll we'll head to the text. Lord God, I ask that today as we look to your word, we look to your word through the lens of a very difficult subject. I pray that we would see your love and grace in the text. I pray that we would see the tools that you have given us to help us be healthy and whole. I pray, Lord God, that that, um, we would hear clearly your care and your concern for us and the ways you'd want us to walk in order to experience all that you have for us. God, we know that you want us to be healthy and whole. So God, we pray you'd help us to see how that we can achieve that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, if you're not already there, because I've mentioned it a few times, (laughs) open your Bible to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. We're going to pick up, uh, starting in verse 9, we're going to read verses 4 to 9 of Philippians 4, uh, and this is from the ESV translation. Rejoice in the Lord always, Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, you pick up on all of the references to our minds in this text. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Other translations say, don't be worried about anything. 
the peace of God will guard your mind. Think about these things. There is a specific focus in this passage on the human mind, on our thought life, and on the emotions wrapped up in the workings of the human brain. And before we go any further, I feel that I must issue a, a disclaimer of sorts because I recognize the tightrope that I'm navigating with this topic today. I am not a doctor. I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not qualified to speak to this topic of mental health from that particular background. What I am is a pastor. I'm a human being who has experienced their own struggles with mental health. And it's that experience and that expertise that I'm going to be pulling from today. I acknowledge the reality of mental illness. I know there's a difference between simply feeling down and clinical depression. I know the grip that anxiety can have on an individual and how it often makes no rational sense. I know that mental health is a broad spectrum representing a variety of illnesses, struggles, and diagnoses. And in no way do I want to discount what anyone is going through with this message or make it sound like there's no need for medicine or counseling when you've, when you've got God. Counseling is a phenomenal tool, and I've recommended, recommended it to, to many people. Medicine properly prescribed and taken is a tool that has positively impacted the quality of life for many people. There are a number of non-spiritual tools and help available to those facing mental health issues that we should avail ourselves of. However, however, and please hear me clearly, we can't ignore the spiritual component of our mental health. We can't ignore the reality of what I shared earlier um, this summer, that we as human beings are comprised of body, soul, and spirit. Remember, when we use the word soul in that context, we're talking about your psychological person, the basis of reason, emotion, personality, your mind, your will, your emotions. Health and wholeness require that we take a holistic approach and address all three components of our being, and each impact the other which means that when we're struggling with our mental health, there are spiritual practices and principles we can put into place to help us in those seasons. There are spiritual tools available to us that will have a positive effect on our mental health. We have to recognize that the God who created us, the God who designed you and designed me, the God who knit us together and knows how we work, he probably has some keen insight into our mental health and what is needed for how to get us right and how to keep, help us to stay right. And so with, with this recognition of God and his creative design that I approach the text today. So we're going to start with the very first we read, or the very first word that we read, and that word is rejoice. We might go, well, that's an odd choice of words when, when talking about mental health, isn't it? Rejoice? Well, maybe, but here's the thing. Number one, Paul doubles down and he emphasizes the point. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. In other words, hey, are you listening? Are you paying attention? Rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice. The repetition of the point invites us to take note and investigate why it's so important. He's trying to get something across to us here of import. Number two, Paul is talking about perspective not activity. When we hear the word rejoice, we tend to think of an action. We think of celebration or delight or cheer and the activities associated with that. Most often we think of these actions in relation to circumstance. I will rejoice, I will celebrate, I will be delighted because something has happened. But Paul's not talking about an action, he's talking about a perspective. He's talking about a mindset that we need to cultivate as followers of Christ. In the context of his writings, Paul always speaks about joy and peace in terms of supernatural feelings that are grounded in the truth of who Jesus is rather than in who we are or what's happening around us or to us. The lie that the world would tell us is this, that joy and peace can only be found by doing the right thing, by thinking the right way, by having the right things. But the joy and peace that Paul writes about are not linked to circumstance at all. In fact, they transcend our circumstance. They transcend our struggles and our issues. They transcend our state of mental health. 
What Paul is describing is a joy that rises up inside and a peace that washes over no matter what is going on. Rejoice is not about delight. Rejoice is not a simple mantra of don't worry, be happy. Just, Just rejoice, church. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just rejoice. It's fine. Don't worry. Just rejoice. Rejoice is about experiencing the grace and joy and peace that can only be found in Jesus. Rejoice is about living in the reality of his presence. Rejoice is about understanding what he has done for us. Because of his death and resurrection, we are now at peace with God. We are citizens of a new kingdom. Our destiny is set. We can experience victory over sin and hardship. Rejoice is about embracing the transformational power of the gospel and allowing a new perspective to take hold of our minds. And it's something that Paul has clearly done in his own life because he wrote this letter. These very words, rejoice, 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 were written from a jail cell in Rome. I'm not exactly sure that a prison is a breeding ground for strong mental health, and yet we can see by the words Paul's written that he has adopted this perspective, this mindset that has set him on the path of having strong, healthy mind. So in your life, consider the following. Is your level of joy and peace linked to circumstance, or is it linked to Jesus? In the midst of your struggles, issues you're facing, Will you shift your perspective and allow the joy of the Lord, the peace of God, to fill your soul? Rejoice, church. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Okay, next part to unpack starts in verse 6. Where Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be be made known to God. Now the NLT phrases it far more succinctly simply says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. For those dealing with anxiety, for those gripped by worry or fear, for those on the verge of breaking due to stress, this pithy statement of, you know, don't worry about anything, just pray about everything, might sound like anything from a spiritual Band-Aid to an outright slap in the face. Oh, you oh, you have anxiety? Have you tried praying? Maybe maybe you should pray about that. Yeah, thanks. I I hadn't thought of that one. Easy answers are rarely welcomed by those struggling with mental health. But we also, we can't ignore the fact that Paul does suggest a link between prayer and anxiety and worry and stress. One commentator notes that prayer and anxiety are two great opposing forces in the Christian experience. So whether or not the answer seems too simple is, not, is beside the point. We have to recognize that the Word of God clearly identifies prayer as an effective tool to be used in managing anxiety, stress, worry. So what does that look like? Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Don't stress. I mean, you can't just turn it off, right? If you've been there, you can't just turn it off. It's not that easy. But maybe instead of what we're doing, instead of fixating on things, instead of trying to wrestle with it in our own strength, instead of being consumed by it, maybe we learn to bring it to God. Maybe we learn to talk with Him. Maybe we learn to view prayer as a conversation rather than a list of demands that need to be answered in order for the prayer to have worked. I think that's where we get tripped up sometimes. We go, God, take this away from me. God, take away my anxiety, take away my stress. And then when it doesn't just magically disappear in a moment, we go, the prayer doesn't work. That's a dumb answer to things. But maybe if we view prayer as a conversation where we, where we let him know what we're going through, where we let him know about what's causing us to be anxious, where we let him know about the cause of the worry or stress that we're experiencing, maybe then as we begin to converse with God, and just share what we're feeling and what we're struggling with and allow him to speak into that, maybe that is different than just simply asking for it to go away and, and being disappointed when it doesn't. And I'm not, I'm not sure it's simply about just praying your anxiety away. I think it's more about vocalizing the specifics in a conversation with God. You know, rather than saying, oh, if you prayed about your anxiety, 
Maybe the question is better phrased, have you prayed about the things that are causing you anxiety? Have you prayed about the things that you are worried about? Have you prayed about the things that are causing you stress? Have you, have you brought these specific pieces to the Lord? You know, I'll give an example. Um, I've had a variety of different experiences with mental health and, and various struggles throughout my life. Um, one of the things, maybe it's an odd one, but I've always, I've always had quite a strong ability to memorize and, and to remember things. And often that looks like I'll, just, I'll keep an a, a ongoing tally of things to remember or to-do list in my head. Uh, I have various mnemonic devices that I use to make sure that, that they stay in there. Um, but every so often, because I'm only human, I'll have like a list of like 10 things, 12 things, 15 things, whatever it is in my head, and I'll, I'll forget one. There'll be like a big a blank space next to a certain number. And for me, there's a level of intense anxiety and stress that comes from knowing that I was remembering something and now it's been forgotten. Um, at certain levels of unhealth, it, it would grip me to the point where like I couldn't function properly. Like, I have to remember what this thing is or like the world will fall apart. And I'll never forget, I was at a men's retreat years ago and Jerry Cook was speaking. And he was sharing his own struggles with mental health um, and shared something incredibly similar to what I just shared. And I'm like, wow, did he just say the same thing that I, that I feel and experience inside myself? And he said that he had to learn to bring it to God and to say, God, I can't remember something right now. And if it's important... I'm going to trust that because you're in control and because you love and care for me, you'll bring it back to my memory. I'm also going to trust that if it isn't important and it's just meaningless, that I'll be able to accept your peace and I'll just let it go and be able to move on. And that's, in when I first heard it, I was like, that's an, that's an impossible task. But I've learned over the years that when that happens, when I'm trying to remember something and it just falls out of my head and I'm begin to feel that grip of anxiety and stress that I have to figure it out or the world will blow up. I'm constantly reminded of just going, God, this isn't going to (laughs) work. So here's the deal. If it's important, I need you to bring it back to my memory. And if it's not, I need to trust you that it's going to be okay and allow your peace to wash over me. And I'm not not lying. The vast majority of times, probably within an hour of praying that prayer, whether it was incredibly important or ridiculously frivolous, whatever that forgotten thought was pops back into my head virtually every time. God has been so faithful that as I have learned to pray that prayer and bring that specific peace to him, that he has graciously answered it by bringing things back to my mind. And I'll say probably nine times out of ten, I'm like, oh, that's dumb. (laughs) Why was I stressing about that? That is completely irrelevant and not needed. But for whatever reason, because anxiety doesn't always make sense, it would grip me, and I found such peace and such release in allowing it to just be brought to God and to let it go. Now, speaking of friends of our church, Jerry Cook is a fantastic friend of our church. Dave Veach is also a great friend of our church. And his son, who pastors in L.A., just released a book entitled Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing. Now think about that for a second. Forget about praying away the anxiety for a moment. Forget about praying for the specific pieces that are creating worry and stress. In the midst of those moments when fear has gripped your mind or worry has gripped your mind or anxiety has gripped your mind, are you praying at all? I cannot state enough how important a healthy, proper, and consistent prayer life is for our mental health. You know, ironically, I caught myself on this one this week. It's been a particularly stressful week for me. I'm between two different trips, so there's a lot to get done in a short amount of time on a variety of fronts. And for whatever reason, I guess I have not been in the best of head spaces this week as well. So you'd think, especially as I was preparing this message of all messages, that I would take my own advice and, and really just be in prayer all week, right? I kid you not, not once, not twice, at least three times, Well, I'm in the midst of struggle up here this week. I hear a small voice inside say, so you're going to stop and pray about that or you're just going to keep going through this crazy cloud of stress? Busted. Just busted time after time. Literally worried about everything because I was praying about nothing. There is something so integral and important to prayer in combating 
worry and stress and anxiety. Now, one more thing I want to highlight here in this section regarding prayer and anxiety is this. The beautiful and powerful promise we find at the end of verse 7, where Paul says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it's that last part, the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. His peace guards your mind. You know, the language used here in the original text is it's speaking of a military concept. It de- depicts a sentry that's standing guard. His peace stands on guard for you. As we bring our worries to him in prayer, as we bring our stresses to him in prayer, as we bring our anxieties to him in prayer, we are promised a peace that makes no sense, a peace that that shouldn't be there in the midst of what we're going through. And we are promised a peace that stands on guard so that the onslaught does not continue. You are not alone in the battle that you are facing. You have a God that promises to protect your mind and bring you peace. Amen? Now, from the importance of a healthy prayer life to the importance of a healthy thought life, Paul understands the influence that one's thoughts has on one's life. What we allow to occupy our mind will sooner or later impact how we speak, how we act which is consistent with what I mentioned off the top today regarding the impact that our mental health can have on our physical health, our relational health, our overall quality of life. What we fix our mind on matters. Matters for our mental health, matters for our emotional health, matters for our spiritual health, matters for our physical health. So Paul says, here's the deal, church. Think about these things. Here's the list. Here's what our minds should be set on in order to remain healthy and whole. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, anything of excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Fix your mind on these things. Paul's final thought on this matter is a reminder that inward peace, the peace of mind that we all crave, will not be preserved in allowing unwholesome thought to take up residence in our minds. Now, that word unwholesome is often equated with the moral compass of our thoughts. And that's part of this for sure. Our thought life impacts our spiritual health. So fixating on unwholesome and sinful thoughts, ideas, or scenarios is not going to result in peace. We need to break any habit of dwelling on sinful or immoral thoughts needs to be broken for sure. But I would argue that unwholesome thought is anything that tears at the wholeness God desires for us. So that could look like dwelling on negative thoughts, negative thoughts about yourself, negative thoughts about others, especially if they're false thoughts about yourself or others. That is unwholesome thought because Paul says whatever is true, right? Unwholesome thought can look like judgmental or hateful thoughts, thoughts that twist and warp our perceptions of people in the world around us because Paul says whatever is honorable and just, right? So how can, we, how can we fix our minds on the right things? Is there some sort of metaphysical switch we can just flip that shifts our brain from the wrong things to the right things? If only it was that easy, right? Ultimately, when it comes to fixing our minds on the right things, it becomes a question of what are we feeding our minds? What are we allowing to come in and take up residence? I was watching, uh, I was watching football after church last week with my parents. And there's a brief news clip. You know those like brief like news flashes where it shows you a bunch of things going on. And it was loaded with nothing but bad news. It's just all, it clips of all the terrible things happening around our world right now. I heard my mom say, "Where's the good news channel? <laughs> you know, where's the channel that tells us of all the good things that are happening in our world? Where's the channel that tells us of the people that are acting honorably and just? Where where can I find that channel?" And it got me thinking. It's interesting. When you think about it, if we're not purposeful, the default information that comes into our lives during the day, the default information that we are in contact with constantly, the news, our social media feeds, the entertainment we consume, the voices of, the, the voices of those around us, how much of that checks Paul's boxes of what we should be thinking about? How much of that is lovely? How much of that is pure? How much of that is commendable or worthy of praise? How much of that is is true? I suggest that we live in a world 
where the vast majority of stuff that we allow in does not line up with Paul's standards for a healthy thought life. Which means that we have to be purposeful in filling our lives with sources of information that do meet the standard. You know, what does that look like? It looks like the Word of God. Read the Bible. Allow His words to permeate our life. Cultivate that healthy prayer life we were talking about. Allow His words to permeate your life. Looks like focusing on relationships that build us up instead of tearing us down. Focusing on, on people that speak life. Focusing on people whose words check Paul's box instead of words that are just negative, impure, unjust, etc. It looks like music that points to God. Books that challenge us to broaden our knowledge and understanding. And we need to find the strength to turn off the sources of information that are perpetuating unhealthy thoughts. You know, if the news is just negative after negative after negative, turn it off. <laughs> Log it out of your socials. Stop allowing the level of just opinion-based discourse that can happen on the social medias. Just log out of it. Just get rid of it. You know, maybe we need to stop consuming certain forms of entertainment. Maybe we need to end relationships that are sources of negative and, 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 and un unhealthy voices in our lives. Remember, what we fix our minds on matters. The health of our thought life impacts the health of other areas of our life. Peace of mind comes as we learn to cultivate a thought life that is worthy of the change that has taken place within us. I'll close with this. My heart is for people to come to know Jesus. My heart is for broken lives that, that don't work to be made whole. For my own experiences with mental health, from what I can see in the world around me today, you know, I, I see the brokenness caused by the mental health crisis. I, I see the hurt. I see the damage. I know that Jesus is the answer. My greatest, my greatest fear in sharing this message today is it would come across as tone deaf, come across as a quick fix or a, a you got this motivational speech that discounts the, the real issues people in this very room, people that are watching right now are dealing with. I pray that is not how it will be received. And it will be on a shadow of doubt that the spiritual tools outlined in Scripture, no matter how simple they sound, are gifts that have been given to us by God, by the God who created us for our health and our well-being. So I hope that today I've been able to add a few more tools to your belt when you're dealing with the issues of mental health. I hope that the development of of a healthy prayer life and a healthy thought life can make a positive impact in your life. Hope that we can learn to adopt a new perspective, allowing joy and peace to flood our lives despite the circumstances or struggles that we find ourselves in the midst of. Hope that we can experience true peace of mind. That we can walk in wholeness, body, soul, and spirit. Let's pray. God, thank you for the, the great love and care that you have for us. And I know that your heart towards us is that we would not live lives that are broken, that we would not live lives that are less than what you have called us to be. And God, I recognize that the mental health crisis that we find ourselves in the midst of as a world right now is one that is full of brokenness and hurt. One that is full of lives that are not whole and lives that are not func functioning the way that you would have designed them to a function. So, God, I pray, pray that by your grace and by your wisdom this morning that we as a church would see the tools written in scripture that you have given to us to help us in this arena of our mental health. God, pray that no one would feel their experiences discounted. Pray that no one would feel that what they have found has, that has helped them is, is less important than just simply praying something away. Um, 
God, I pray that more than anything that we would recognize that these are just additional tools, things that, that impact us, body, soul, and spirit, that you've designed to aid us as we live our lives and strive for health and wholeness. So God, I pray for anyone watching today who is struggling in any area of mental health. God, I pray that you would meet them where they are at, that you would bring them peace, that you would bring them calm, that you would help them to find ways to walk in wholeness. pray you'd help them to put good practices in place, um, find the help they need to be able to walk in all that you have for them and to um, walk out of the struggle they are currently finding themselves in. God, I pray for those of us who are not in the midst of a mental health crisis right now. I pray that as we read today, your peace would guard our minds, that you would protect us. Um, God, that we would not live in fear of, you know, falling into the next mental health trap, but that, God, we would recognize that you, the God of peace, you guard our hearts, you guard our minds, you protect us. God, I pray that you'd help us to cultivate healthy prayer lives, healthy thought lives, Help us to do the work that creates a strong foundation upon which to build a healthy um, approach to mental to our to our to our mind. And God, I just really pray that you would um, speak to us in this touchy and, and tricky subject. Last thing is this: if you're watching today and you have not yet made a decision for Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. He loves you. He cares for you. He died so that you may live. He died so that you may find forgiveness of all your sins and may find healing for the broken parts of your life. So if you'd like to invite Jesus to be a part of your life today, it's as simple as praying this prayer along with me. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I believe that you died on a cross for my sins, that you rose again in, in victory so that I can walk in the healing and the newness of life that we've spoken of today and it's promised in your word. God, I ask that today that your grace and your love and your mercy would pour into my life, that I would experience your presence, that you would equip me to walk in the ways you're asking me to walk. Amen. If that's you, we'd love to celebrate with you. Um, let someone know. Reach out to one of our pastors. Come to the church office. We want to celebrate the decision you've made today. We want to get a Bible into your hands. We want to let you know how to connect with our church uh, on an ongoing basis. What an incredible choice you just made today for Jesus. Well, that's our service church. As always, we love you. We care for you. Please let us know how we can be praying for you, how we can support you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And uh, as I said at the top, we have so many great things coming up in the life of our church. Make sure to get involved, get plugged in, be a part of all that's going on here. We love you. Have a great week.